All right, well, we might as well get going. So let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, stuff to talk about. One, uh, there's more homework for you. Woohoo! Um, if you look on the Answer Learn site, this will be the last homework for uh, for the digital topics. And it's just some more back of the back of the chapter sort of questions and from chapters four and five in the uh, in the digital electronics book, which is up at the top under uh, syllabus and other documents. And you can give those chapters a read if you want, or you should just be able to do those problems um, just straight from what you've already seen with the lectures. And so those are due a week from today. Again, shouldn't be too too terribly bad. And the other thing then is I am probably going to finish up with the digital stuff um, on Monday, which means it's a good time to have a test. So plan on the next test in this class and just covering the digital material then a week from Monday or that'll be then the, uh, the 12th of April. And so it'll be the format will be a lot like the last test. You know, you'll have a you'll have a time period over which you can take it and uh, you know, shouldn't be shouldn't be too big of a surprise. Um, and when, as we finish with the digital, then we're going to transition to sort of the last topic we're going to talk about, which is uh, basically Arduinos and how they work and how to program them and things like that. And so also, if I can get this all set up right, um, I've gone and bought you all little Arduino starter kits that contain an Arduino and a whole bunch of little things you can plug into it, like a little ultrasonic range finder and a, a fan and a servo motor and a joystick and LEDs and stuff like that. Then, um, So next week, we're going to try and get those all uh, passed out to you. Um, I think everybody except for one person is in town, and so you can just swing by the department and grab your kit. And no, um, I am not expecting these back, so um, we'll touch on them a little bit. And if you like what if you like what you're doing, you know, you can spend the whole summer then building all sorts of interesting things with these Arduinos. And so that's sort of how the, the course is going to finish out. Then the next thing we'll talk about then is Arduinos and how to program them and how to get them to do interesting things. So, any questions about that? Okay, cool. All right. Um, I want to sort of uh, pick up where I left off, though, on Monday when we were looking at this idea then of a, a clocked flip-flop and this idea then that the flip-flop is only going to change its output then um, depending on the clock signal. And I'm going to do what we sort of go through what we did on Monday, except I'm going to make it a little bit more challenging. We're now, now I've got a flip-flop, so something like this. And I've got two outputs, and we're just going to look at the output Q, but then there's also a Q bar. And maybe we've got a reset line coming in, and we've got a set line coming in, and we've got a clock line here. So there's our clock line. This is kind of like what we did on Monday, except that it's all backwards. Ow! Where here, maybe in the case of this flip-flop then, um, the, the, uh, for, the, for the set signal, then, I've written a bar above it. And for the reset signal, I've written a bar above it. And what do you think that means? This is where you go, oh, those must be active low inputs. So to reset the flip-flop, then, i got to take the reset line low in order for it to reset. To set the flip-flop, i got to take the set line low to set the flip-flop. And I've written the clock here with the little arrow, which is telling me this is a clock input, but I've put a bubble in front of the in front of that input for the clock. What's that telling you? And you're going, yeah, this is a clock then that triggers on negative going transition set for the clock. So this flip-flop then is only going to set the outputs then, Q and Q bar. It's only going to it's only going to change those outputs then when your clock is transitioning to low. If you look back in your notes on Monday, we talked about a flip-flop then with um, uh, a positive going transitions for the clock then and, and um, active high input. So I've reversed everything for you um, just to mess you up. Um, all right, so we can think though about what these inputs are gonna look like. Here's the set input, here's the reset input, here's the clock input, and here's our output Q then. And we can think about how they're going to change then um, with time. And so um, it's active low, so I'm going to start with my sets and my resets high, and I'm going to start then with my clock high. And let's just say we walk up to this then, and the flip-flop is reset. And so my output Q then is low. I can think about, okay, well, I'm going to basically then take the set line, and I'm going to run it low for a little while. 
I'll keep the reset line high, and I'll keep the clock high. How's the output going to change then? If I drop the set low, resets uh, kept high, clocks kept high, Q. You're going to say no change because the Q, it's only going to set the output then on negative going clock transitions. And so Q then, even though I've set this thing high, Q's not going to change. And so, all right, well, finally, all right, fine. I'll, I'll take the clock low then. So now I take the clock low. I keep the reset high. I keep the set low. And now when I take the clock low, what happens? I hear the clock line high, high, high. Boom, now the clock, clock line goes low. And you look up here, reset is high, set is low. And you go, yeah, I'm not even going to bother to press the unmute button because it's that easy set, or that the output then goes high. We've set the flip-flop. Now I'm going to put some sort of, oh, that's not even close. Um, I can put some sort of little dotted line here then where they, they sort of line up like that. And then I can take the clock line back high, something like that. And of course the set's not going to change. I'm just going to get everybody lined up here then. I'll take the set back up, something like this. And oh, I don't know. What happens if I take the clock low again? I'm just making this up as I go along. So, so here um, I've said the clock is going low again, set is high, reset is high. Oh no, that's Q. Yes, sorry. Oh, I should, oh, man. All right. All right, I'm going to take the clock low, and I gave it away almost. So I take the clock low again. What happens to Q here? I've got set is high, reset is high. The clock goes low, Q. And you go, no change, because I haven't to told it to set. I haven't told it to reset, I haven't told it to do anything. And so even though the clock goes low here, well, I haven't told it to do anything, so it holds the same value of Q. All right, now I'm gonna bring everybody back up. You know how this goes. I'm gonna um, take the reset line low then, something like that. And I'm gonna keep then the clock high and set high. So now I've taken the reset line low, the set line is high. Um, but the clock is still high. What happens to Q? And you go, nothing, because the clock is still high here. Q is only going to change on a negative going clock transition. Um, great, now I already drew it. Ow! <laughs> All right. Well, you know what's going to happen next, then? I'm going to take the clock low, and I'm, I'm going to force myself not to draw Q. There we go. I've taken the clock line low. The reset line is low. The set line's high. What's going to happen? And you go, you go, Q goes low. At this point, then, it's another negative going clock transition. And the flip-flop's going to say, oh, time to look at the set and reset lines. They're both low. And so I'm going to I'm gonna take the output then low because I'm seeing a, a reset command here. All right, I'm going to bring everybody back high again. Something like this. And now, one last thing. Um, I'm going to take set low. And I'm going to keep reset high. And at the exact same time, I'm going to take the clock low. So here then, uh, so here then, I've taken my, my set line low. So I'm telling it to set. But at the exact same time I'm taking the clock low, what's going to happen? Maybe. Maybe not. And that's what I want to talk about next then, is this idea of timing. And that for, for circuits like this, like for flip-flops and, and especially if you've got circuits then that are, you know, a, a base and, you know, what am I trying to say? They're synchronous circuits then where you're waiting for a clock to go high or a clock to go low, something like that. And they're waiting then on this clock signal then to set their outputs. You can, you can run into timing situations where, oh, well, what I'm going to talk about then is this idea of setup time, where it's going to take a little bit of time in the flip-flop for the internal circuitry to set up 
once I, once I set this set line active, if I take it low in this situation, or if it's active high, if I take it high, it takes a little time for the, for the innards um, to say, oh, that was a set, and to get ready then for that clock signal. I'm anthropomorphizing, but this idea then of, of worrying, worrying then about timing, and, and this idea then of setup times and hold times. So this is what I want to talk about next then. Set up and hold times then. And this idea of, oh, uh, slow down. Maybe a, a reliable flip-flop or something that, a flip-flop then that, that triggers reliable. So a reliable flip-flop trigger. And so you say, okay, it's going to respond. active clock so it's going to respond then to a to a cl active clock edge either an ngt or a, a positive going transition you know depending on what sort of flip-flop you're looking at then responds to the active clock edge uh, and basically reads the input then looks as the set line uh, active is the reset line active then and updates Output after predictable uh, propagation delay. All right. So basically, this idea if I've got a, a, a reliable flip flop trigger going on here, then it's going to see the it's going to see the active clock input. It's going to look at the it's going to look at the inputs at that point. It's going to set the output for the flip flop based on what the inputs are set to after some predictable amount of time. This is the you know. When I'm talking just sort of theory stuff, we can pretend this is all happening, you know, instantaneously. But in the real world, there are little transistors in there that are turning on and off. I mean, things are things are actually happening then. This is very different then from an unreliable uh, uh, an unreliable uh, trigger. And let me just show you an example. So an example then would be we've got a flip-flop. And let's see. We've got a flip-flop then, and it's initially it's it's initially then in this reset state. And so it's initially in the reset state and change control input to uh, no, there's only one L. Good. Control input to set too close to clock. All right, so if we change the control input then to set too close to the clock edge. So just sort of the example I was diagramming there, where we took the set line and we set the set line low, set the set line to active, but at the same time then we did a negative going clock transition and, and they were both happening at the same time. So I set the flip-flop then, I set the flip-flop too close to the trigger point, too close to the clock edge. And there are different things that can happen in this case. Uh, one is, One is nothing happens. The flip-flop stays in the reset state. So it's, a, it's almost like, well, it's not almost like, it doesn't even see then um, that set control because it happened, it happened too close to the, to the clock edge. It didn't have time to react to that, that set input then when the clock finally triggered the flip-flop. And so it's like it, it never happened, like that set control um, never happened. Another thing that can happen is the flip-flop then output begins to change. So it begins to change to set, but returns to reset. Uh, 
going through so going through uh, metastable states uh, <laughs> and short term abnormal voltages. All right, that's a lot of words there. But the idea then is the flip-flop, it begins to change to the set state on the output. So it goes from a low, it's on its way to a, it's on its way to a high, but it, and it, it changes, and, oh, no, there, it goes back down to low again. It goes back down to the reset state. So it starts to change to set, but doesn't stay set, doesn't make it to set, goes back down to that, that low state. And you can talk about it being in sort of a metastable state as that change is happening. But what's really really can be important though is this idea of you can have abnormal voltages on the output then at that point and what do I mean by an abnormal voltage for an output here when we're talking about these sorts of logic circuits it's going way back to the beginning not really digital and remember we, we talked about this idea that you know for for these circuits it's in ideally, you know, zero volts is low and five volts is high. But in the real world, though, there's a range of voltages. And so if you're looking at these TTL, these transistor to transistor logic circuits, then you can talk about a range of allowable low values and a range of allowable high values. And typically a low, then anything between zero and 0.8 volts, we're going to call it a low. And if you look at the data sheets then for these chips, yeah, they're going to recognize pretty much anything between 0 and 0 0.8 as a low. And likewise, then for the high, there's a range of voltages then that are acceptable as highs, typically between anything between 2 and 5 volts. So 0 and 0.8 is your, your sort of range of lows, and 2 to 5 is your range of highs. But there's this band in between 0.8 volts and 2 volts then. And remember that band is there then for noise because you don't want noise kicking a low from a high or a high to a low if you've got noise. So you got that 1.8 volt sort of no man's land or no voltage land then that's, that, that are basically illegal voltages or abnormal voltages. And what can happen though is the flip-flop output then maybe for, for a, a few nanoseconds then it's putting out, oh, I don't know, uh, 1.5 volts which is a totally legal output then. So you get then these abnormal voltages. They can in turn confuse the circuitry that's further down the line. Like de depending on how, on how the gates are structured, it can see a 1.5 volt as a high or a low. Who knows? Um, so it, it's totally abnormal and um, illegal output then. The third thing that could happen is that the flip-flop then output, oop, ah, begins to set or to change to set then but hesitates oh I gotta write better hesitates in uh, Not quite sure how to say this, so I'm just going to use my own words. So, um, so, so the idea then is the, the flip-flop, it begins to set, but it spends a little time then so it's sort of hesitating. And again, you get these invalid voltages. It takes, it takes a little bit, it takes too long for it to set. You've got this whole period then where these voltages are invalid and it eventually makes it to set, but while it's spitting out these invalid voltages, then your logic further down the line, further down the circuit, the stuff then that this, this flip-flop is tied to then later on, it looks at these invalid voltages and basically then just gets confused. And so what can happen then is if, if, you, if you basically, you know, you set, send the set signal to the flip-flop, and if you do the clock too close to that, then um, there's all sorts of situations that are going to lead to unpredictable behavior, depending on how that flip-flop reacts to it. And it can react to it then in all sorts of different ways. And so this is something then in order.
order for, for reliable behavior, in order for our flip-flops then to set and reset um, sort, of, uh, sort of reliably, we have to worry then about two, um, two timing requirements. Oh, hold on. Behavior. All right, so we've got two timing requirements then for, for um, reliable behavior. The first is the setup time. And so um, uh, I don't know if we want to use words here. It's the time immediately preceding the active clock cycle or basically how long before the active clock cycle then do you have to send your control input then. Um, and so you can think about, I don't know, we've got some sort of control input. Oh, what is going on with my pen? Hold on. Ah, there. So we've got a control input, something like this. It's going low to high. So this would be low, high, and maybe it's an active high. And again, for, for control input, maybe this is a set command, or maybe this is a set input, or it's a reset input with an active high, so I'm going to run it high. And you have to worry, though, you know, here's your time, or here's your clock input. So here's your clock input, something like this, and you're going to then take the clock from low to high. So maybe it's a clock then. It's going to trigger on positive going transitions. And you have to worry then about how, how high, how much, in, how far in time in front of this positive going clock transition, in front of this active clock transition, how early do you have to have this control input set before you send it then the clock signal? And so we talk about sort of, you know, the 50% level here. And this is the idea then of, let me get the notation right yet. TS, your setup time. So, so, so you know, how many nanoseconds do you have to have the input set up then before you can send it then that active clock edge in order for the flip-flop then to basically do a reliable set or reliable reset. And you can imagine then on the other end, so this was setup time, you can imagine on the other end the idea of hold time. And it's not obvious but you actually have to hold that input on the back end too. After the clock, after you send it the, you know, the, the controlling clock edge, the active clock edge, after you send it that, then you have to hold those inputs for a little while after that too, in order for all of that to propagate through the chip and in order then for your output then to match what you expect to see on the output in order to get a reliable behavior. And so a similar situation, here's your control input then, Again, we'll do active high, so you're going then from high to low. And you can think about then, um, oh, no, hold on, don't draw that. I didn't give myself enough space. Ah, I forgot we're doing hold time. So there we go. So here's your control input then, high to low. And here then is your clock input. Maybe it's doing something like this. Your clock then is resetting. You're going from high to low. So here's 50% of your clock signal on the way down. Here's 50% of your control signal then on the way down. And it's the same sort of thing, though. You can talk about, oh, wow. So you can talk then about your hold time. How long do you have to keep this control signal high if it's an active high control signal? How long do you have to keep it high after the clock after the clock goes back down? Um, uh, oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. What did I do wrong? Do you see it? Yeah, sorry about that. Too excited. This is, a, this is an active, this is a, a positive going clock. I did my clock backwards, sorry. All right, so here we go. Oh, that's, there we go. Sorry, all right, that's horrible, but here's my clock then going from low to high. It's a positive going transition. And so this is my hold time. Sorry, I got my clock upside down. All right. 
So basically then this is the clock telling the flip-flop then, it's, it's a positive going transition, telling the flip-flop then to look at the output or the control inputs and set the output according to them. And I have to hold these outputs though for a little bit after that clock edge then, or I have to hold the inputs for a little bit after the clock edge then in order for that output then to be reliable, in order for that, that, that you know, result to propagate them through um, the chip. And we talk about, you know, how long does it take from when I set the chip to I see it on the output, then that propagation time, you know, how long does that all take then to get it right? Does that make sense? Yeah, all right, sorry about the whole clock thing. Um, all right, and if you're, if you're actually working with circuits then, you can, you can go and look at the data sheet then for, for any of these chips, for any of these gates, and this is stuff the manufacturer then tells you. And so, oh, come on, there we go. So this is the data sheet then for Texas Instruments set for a 74377, which is a, an octal D-type flip-flop with clock enable. So you already can tell what a lot of this is about then. So octal D-type flip-flop then, it's, it, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's a flip-flop then with eight outputs then on a chip, and you've got a clock enable then, so it's, it's a D-type flip-flop, but you also have another line that, that basically turns the clock on and off. We're not going to worry about that. But you go through, and there's sort of the logic table for it. What we're looking for here then is, where is it? Ah, there we go. So timing requirements then. And they've got sort of the clock frequency and the pulse duration then. Um, how, how wide then does the clock pulse need to be in order for it to see up? The, the good stuff we've been talking about here then. Oh, this is the setup time then for the clock and a little upward arrow then for the positive going transition on the clock, which basically triggers the, the flip-flop then. So this is a, a triggers the flip-flop then on a positive going uh, clock transition. And um, whether or not your data line is high or low, you're going to need two, a minimum then of two nanoseconds then. Basically, you have to set that data line a minimum of two nanoseconds then um, before the clock input um, hits it then. And also, there's a little bit dependent on whether your clock uh, enable line is high or low. We're not going to get into that then. And then the next, next bit here then is the hold time. Data high or low then, the hold time then is one nanosecond. And so for this, for that chip then, if you're, ah, ugh. If you're building a circuit then using that chip, you have to worry about that. All right, give me a second. Er, come on. All right, but all right. So if you're, if you're working with that chip then, um, you've got a, a setup time then of two nanoseconds. You've got to have this control. If you want to set the chip then, you've got to have the control high for two nanoseconds then before you send it that positive clock edge and You've got to hold that input, that set input, for another nanosecond then um, after the clock goes high then in order for the output then to set reliably. And so that's, that's something then that, that uh, what do I want to say? That's something that you need to worry about then in real life when you're building then uh, real circuits with this. Make sense? Okay. Pardon? I'm not going to say I want lag, but I have to deal with it. And in a perfect world, this, yes, would all be instantaneous and, and life would be so much easier if I didn't have to worry about timing and digital circuits, but they're made out of, out of real things that, yes, uh, signals do take a while then um, to, to propagate then. And all right, so um, all right, I am just looking through what I have next. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, all right. So I want to go back. This will seem a little bit reviewish, but uh, it leads into what I want to talk about next then. Um, and we can think then about looking at a clocked D flip-flop. Wait, why are you said that? So we're looking then at a clocked D flip-flop and, uh, all right, this is, this is going to crash again, but it occurs to me I want to show you something then. Um, you know, you're looking at a clock D flip-flop. I just want to draw it real quick because you know what this looks like then. We've got Q, Q bar. These are the outputs then. And we've got an input then D. And we've got our clock input here. All right. 
right? And you know how this works. So then um, looking at this clock input here, there's no bubble here. So this flip-flop then is going to trigger on a positive clock edge. And I, I guess it is a little bit different though from what we're talking, what we've been talking about then. What is different here? We've got outputs Q and Q bar, we've got our clock input. Yeah, there's no, there's no second input on this. There's no separate set and reset lines then. And this whole, the whole idea then is Q is equal to D. Basically, whenever the clock goes positive, whenever there's a positive going transition on your clock, then the output Q is going to be set to the input D, just regardless. If Q is 1, you send it to, if D is 1, you send it to clock, boom. It'll basically store it and output then that 1 on Q. If when the clock goes positive, the input D is 0, it'll set Q to 0. And, and thinking about then what this looks like, I just want to show you this. And yes, you're going to crash. You always crash. Um, so here we go. Uh, I don't know why all that stuff stuck. Oh, that was bad. I don't know why that stuff's at the bottom here. But here's the here's the basic idea, though. Here's the logic diagram then for one of these clocked D flip flops. And bits of this you've seen before, especially right here. Does that look familiar? You built this in lab. That's a named lab. That's a named latch right there. Woohoo! So this is really just a named latch with a bunch of other stuff in front of it. Some other NAND gates. I'm not going to step through the logic. If you get bored tonight, you can, but um, we really don't have time for it then. But it's basically then just six NAND gates wired up like this with here's your clock input then, here's your data input. And if you think about a NAND gate, um, if you were trapped on a desert island with nothing but transistors and resistors, could you build a NAND gate? And I'm hoping you stop and think and go, yeah, I can build that. I can build a NAND gate. It might look something like this then, where I've got an input A and an input B. Here's my 5 volts, my VCC. I've got a current limiting resistor. I've got a couple of transistors here then, and here's my output then from, from the NAND gate that I'm going to build. And if A and B here then, if my input's A and B, I also got some current limiting resistors here then, but if my input's A and B are low, these two transistors are turned off, and if I look, my output here then, I've got 5 volts, it runs through this resistor, here's where I'm looking at the output, and then it goes through these two transistors to ground. And we remember from analog that if the transistors are shut off, if there's no, uh, no potential, no current at the base here, the transistors are shut off, then I'm going to get no current then flowing through the transistors to the ground. What I'm going to see on this output then is basically the voltage across this resistor, and, and well, wait a minute then, I'm pretty much going to see my VCC on here. If I'm not pulling a lot of current, if I don't have a big voltage drop across that resistor, I'm just going to see basically some voltage on here. I'm going to see a high. And thinking about that, oh yeah, okay, so if A and B then are both low, the transistors are shut off then, I'm going to see voltage then at this output then, I'm going to call that a 1. I can turn on transistor B, uh, or sorry, we'll start with A. I can turn on transistor A. I can apply some potential here, uh, get a little bit of current flowing maybe, turn on transistor A. Is that going to change anything for this output? And you go, no, because there's still no path to ground. Transistor A may be turned on, but transistor B is not turned on. So, so there's still no path to ground here. I can reverse the situation then. I've got no input on A. A is zero volts. This transistor is turned off. I put a little current on B. I've got a little base action going on B. I turn on transistor B. I find transistor B is turned on. But well, wait a minute though. With transistor A turned off, I'm not going to get any current flowing through here. And so the output then is still going to stay high. It's still, I'm still going to see some voltage on here. Because if either one of these, these inputs, A or B, then has zero volts on it, those transistors are turned off. I've got no current to ground. Boom, I'm going to see a high here. So build in the logic table with B and A, although it's weird, they're sort of backwards. Then. If either A or B and or A and B, if any of these are, are off, I get nothing. I get the, the high output. But think about what happens. So if you do put some voltage on A or B, get some current flowing here then, put some highs on A or B, I'm going to have some, some current through the base here then. 
those transistors are going to turn on. If A and B both have voltage on them, the transistors are going to turn on. They're switching transistors. And so transistor B turns on, connects to ground. Transistor A turns on, connects to ground. What am I going to measure then at the output if there's a path to ground here then from this, from the end of this resistor then to ground, if that path is open, what am I going to see at my output? You know, yeah, it's connected to ground through the transistors. I'm not going to measure any voltage. I'm just going to have my current going right through VCC, going through this resistor. Thank goodness it's here because otherwise it would fry everything. So this limits the current that's flowing. Basically, you know, everything from these two transistors you know, up to that resistor, including my output, then is tied to ground. I'm going to see a low on the output. And so here we go. If I build this circuit then and I look at the inputs A and B, I'm always going to get a high output. I'm always going to see voltage on my output unless both A and B are turned on, unless there's some voltage on A or B that's turning on those switching transistors that's applying some current through the base. I've built a NAND. Yay! And I could build maybe six of these NANDs, and I could put them together then and basically build myself then wiring it like this, just with transistors and resistors, that I could build this clocked flip-flop then that triggers on positive going transitions, this clocked D flip-flop. And the D just means it's a one input sort of data, uh, data flip-flop. <sighs> All right, that to me is absolutely amazing though, that I could just have a little bucket of transistors and resistors, and the next thing I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The next thing I know, I'm building then um, one of these clocked D flip-flops. All right, that will be, come on. There we go. Yeah, yeah. So I get excited about that. All right, and we can think, there we go. We can think really quick about what the timing on this is going to look like as the inputs change. And so maybe I can imagine some sort of situation where here's D and it goes something like this. I'm just going to draw these real quick and then talk about them. There we go, something like that, and whatever. And here then is my clock. And uh, all right, these are all supposed to be symmetrical and supposed to be pretty. You've been with me long enough to know I cannot draw. And so on then. So there's my clock. And I want to think then about what uh, what Q looks like. And actually, we're going to, we'll just assume. Ah, and we're just assuming. that we walk up to this flip-flop then, and it's starting um, high. And let me put some lines on here to just sort of guide me. So we're interested then in the positive going clock transitions only. That's the only time then the output of this flip-flop is going to change then. So when those signals on the clock line, when they go high. All right. And so this should just be like a walk in the park to you guys now, because you're just walking along and, and here's the flip-flop then, and it sees that first positive going transition. The, the D line is set low. What's, what's going to happen to Q then? And you go, ah, it sees the clock. It's basically just going to set the output to whatever D is equal to. And for that first one then, D is equal to zero. And it's going to stay zero until the next clock transition, next positive going clock transition. So here's a positive going clock transition right here. D is high. What happens to Q? You go, oh, Q is going to get set high again. There we go. Yay. And nothing's going to change till the next clock transition, positive going clock transition. You say, oh, well, at this clock transition, then D is low again. Whenever you have a positive, tra positive transition on the clock, Q is set to D. So here then it's going to set that D is low. So Q is going to go low again. It's not going to change till the next clock transition. You know, oh, here it's the same thing again, like, like that other one, where, where now then we've got a positive going clock transition, then D is high, so Q gets set high. Oh, well, what about here then? We've got another positive going clock transition. D is still high. What happens to Q? This stays the same. And you say, all right, and nothing happens then until the next clock transition positive going clock transition, which is right here. Oh, D is set low here at this point, so it's going to take Q low. And on this last clock transition, then D is still low, and so it just stays low. 
and so on. Make sense? I think it makes sense. All right. So that's like, okay. <laughs> um, let me show you something, I don't know, that I think is like tantamount to magic. Um, what if I put three D flip-flops together? All right, so I've got something like this. I've got a black box here then. Still wasn't a wide enough box for me to write the word combinatorial, but basically this is some sort of combinatorial logic circuit here that's maybe got some outputs then, X, Y, and Z. So it's got these outputs then, X, Y, and Z, and I'm gonna run each of X, Y, and Z then up to the D lines then of some, uh, some clock D flip-flops. So maybe I'll have flip-flop number one, Flip-flop number two, flip-flop number three, and I'll talk about, you know, I got the D input, D input, D input, and these will be the clock inputs, something like this. And so I'll connect then X up to D1, Y up to this flip-flop, Z up to this flip-flop, something like that. And then what I'll also, though, and I'll do this in sort of a different color then, I'll also take these clock lines, and eh, this is getting a little horrible here, and I'll just tie all them together, something like this. And that'll be then my clock input. All right, so um, yeah, well, I can think that I'm also going to, I got my outputs here then. So this will be Q1, Q2. Q3, there's also a Q1 bar, Q2 bar, Q3 bar, but for this I'm not going to really care about them. But these then are my outputs then, Q1, Q2, Q3. Now, what are these flip-flops then, are, are they going to trigger on positive or negative clocks? And looking at it then, I didn't put a bubble in front of them then, so these are going to be, they're basically going to trigger then on, their, on a positive going transition. And I can ask myself, I can think about, well, what's going to happen then if I send a clock signal then that looks like this? So this is my input clock signal then. I've got my positive going transition here. So on this clock input then, when I send it, basically a positive going transition, what's going to happen? So when you see the PG, the positive going transition, Q1 is going to be equal to X, Q2 is going to be equal to Y, Q3 is going to be equal to output Z. And then I can take this clock low again, and how are these outputs going to change? So I've got some combinatorial logic, I don't know, I've got, I don't know, my alarm system then that I built in lab with the ABC, D, ABC inputs then, and, and whatever, it's coming out of here, X, Y, and Z. I've got it hooked up then to 3D flip-flops then. I send the flip-flops a positive going transition, and the outputs then of those flip-flops then, output one gets set to whatever was output on X, output two then, Q2 then gets set to whatever was out, being output on Y, output Z then, that's gonna be set to Q3, and I take that clock low, after I run it high and I set these outputs then of my flip-flops, I run that clock low again, what happens? They go, they stay. It's a flip-flop. Guess what you just did? You just took the values of whatever this circuit was spitting out, was the door open, the window open, whatever, X, Y, and Z. You just stored them. And as long as you don't take that clock back positive again, these outputs then are going to retain whatever was coming out of that combinatorial logic, you've just stored these values then in a circuit. You've built then a circuit that remembers stuff. And you've just built them out of these little D flip-flops then, which are just a bunch of NAND gates, which you can just build from a box of little transistors and resistors. You can build your NAND gates, you can build those into flip-flops. You can put the flip-flops in a row like this then, connect them up to something, and you can use that to store 
to store values, to store data. You've built that memory. Ah, oh, to me, that's amazing. You've built something then that's going to remember whatever was happening with this, with this combinatorial logic. And it's going to remember that until, until you tell it to remember something else, until you set it again and say, all right, never mind that. Set it to, to whatever that, that circuit is doing now. And so this idea of, of you know, uh, basically memory, and, and actually then you can also use this then for this idea then for, for storage too, data storage and transfer. That's what I think. You can also use this sort of technique then to transfer data um, as well as to store it. And so you can store data though. Um, you can store binary data. And it doesn't have to just be these three bits coming out of this. You can, you can have it really store any number that you can express in binary or BCD values or any of that stuff we can talk about. If you can put it in a binary form, you can now store it. And so we talk about this idea then of a register. And a register then um, is basically A group of flip flops like the three I just had here then uh, that store in that store value values or information or outputs or whatever you want to call it. And you can use the same idea though. You can use the same idea. You can use the registers then not only to store values, but also uh, what's the word transfer. Oh, there's a U in there. They can also, they, you can also use registers then to not only store data, but you can also use them then to transfer data. And I'm just curious, uh, I don't know how much you guys think about such things, but what are the two ways you can transfer data in the most general form? And although it's, it's not as much going on today, we only pretty much typically use one form. But back when I was much younger then, there were two ways to, to transmit, transmit data, transfer data. Uh, that's a good one. It wasn't what I was thinking about, but I like that. I was thinking about more, I can either do it in parallel or I can do it in serial. Where in serial then, if I want to send you a number, I go one, oh, one, one, oh, one, and I just send the numbers like down a pipe one at a time. Or I can think about doing it in parallel where I have, if I want to send an 8-bit number then, I have eight data lines then, and I just send all the data at once, and each line then corresponds to one bit in the word I'm trying to send then. And so I send then the, the word all at once across eight data lines. All right, well, we don't have time to get into the super details about this, but you can imagine uh, pros and cons of each. Which do you think per clock cycle is faster, sending information then serially or, data or, or in parallel? Yeah, in parallel, because in one clock cycle, I can say, go, here's all the stuff. I'm going to send it all in one, bam, there you go. As opposed to serial, where every clock cycle, here's the one, here's the zero, here's the one, here's another one, here's the zero. That's a lot slower. And so one of the advantages of parallel then is it's, it's much, 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 much faster. Uh, but what are the disadvantages of parallel? You know, you need a lot of channels you need, and each of those channels, if you're actually building something, then needs to be a wire. And back in the day, we had like parallel printers that you would hook up to your PC and you had serial stuff like modems and things like that. Those parallel printers then had those big, thick ribbon cables then. They had like 16, no, actually more than that, like 18, 20 wire, 24 wires in these ribbon cables then, but they were much faster than the serial lines because they could send the data, you know, basically multiplex. They could send the data much, much faster. You don't see that much these days, though, because um, the serial stuff has just gotten so fast. The electronics has just gotten so fast. And the economy then, well, you see this in your computer, right? You take out the hard drive of your computer. What what kind of hard drive is it? What's the interface on it? It's a SATA, S-A-T-A, serial ATA. And it's really, it's basically just sending the data to the hard drive and back then across a serial line. And yeah, there's some voltages and control lines and stuff, but basically your data is being sent back and forth um, serially. Remember the P-A-T-A interfaces on the hard drives, those big old ribbon cables? Eh, you're all are too young. 
But back in the day, we had big, big, thick ribbon cables. So it was the parallel ATA interface where you actually then did have a wire for each bit you were sending back and forth in the word to the hard drive. And you had to do it then because back then that was just a lot faster than anything you could do serially. With lines today, though, and the, the electronics, it can switch much faster. Um, and it's just so much cheaper to use a serial interface as opposed to parallel. Um, that's why we're all using serial now. I see I'm out of time. Well, we'll talk a little bit then about this on Monday then, about how you can set up then um, a bunch of flip-flops like this and actually use them then to, to not only store information, but to transfer it from sort of one place to the other. Any questions? All right. Well, um, don't forget there's no lab this week because Friday's a holiday. And, and just, you know, just tonight thinking Marvel though about this idea of just some trans, this is all just transistors and resistors that are doing this. It, to me, it's a miracle. All right. Have a good, uh, I guess, have a good holiday. And um, I will see you on Monday and stop by if you have any questions for office hours.